thank you for having me here, and I hope that um, the, the presentation will shed some light on um, the perspective we, as uh, the group of independent scientists, um, elaborated for understanding the challenge of uh, sustainable development and looking for, um, making proposals for accelerating the, the implementation. And we started our work in 2020, so just shortly after uh, the COVID pandemic uh, started, and so we met virtually. And we saw how the crisis developed, and we tried to still remain optimistic and, propose, and make proposals for, for action. And we delivered our report last year, and my time as co-president is on, over. Yeah, so uh, the next group will be put together this year and start its work at the end, uh, around October this year, to deliver the next report for 2027. So the um, objective of this report is to, uh, it is mandated by the General Assembly. Uh, it is mandated explicitly as an independent report. Uh, and it should inform the SDG summit, which is a meeting of the heads of state, also every four years only. And it's mandated to strengthen the interaction between society, policy, and science, so that science uh, uh, can be useful in this um, process of, um, of sustainable uh, development. And we, did not be, we weren't able, of course, to make own research, but we had to base our report on existing uh, literature and also on existing UN reports, so an assessment of assessment of assessments. <clears throat> and for the independence, I, I would like to assure you that we did not have um, a text which was then rephrased by UN specialists on soft language. And we had, uh, a, peer, we had a peer review by scientists which, who gave very good advice for the improvement of the report. We also sent it to the member states and we got positive comments, we got um, negative comments, we shouldn't use this term or that term, and we happily ignored that uh, because we didn't think it was useful. And so this is just to make clear to you that it was a very interesting process, a learning process, but it really was an independent uh, report. This is the group of 15 scientists. Um, we were a very diverse group. Uh, all continents, including Australia, were um, present, many, many different disciplines. Um, and uh, different backgrounds, and uh, it was a pleasure to work with my colleagues, and I'm really missing them. And I would say we had a, a very dynamic uh, core group of 10 out of 15, which is quite a good uh, number, actually, uh, because some of our colleagues were also impeded by COVID, obviously, the colleague from China um, or other events like um, the war, uh, our colleague from Russia. Um, but uh, still, we maintained a, a lot of connection uh, through the internet. So now, what did we find? <clears throat> um, this is a, a slide to show where are we now. And it's a complex graph, but as I said, you can look at the report uh, in the net. Um, but what it shows us, and these are not data we um, gathered, and this is an analysis done by, by the UN, by UNDP mostly, that's where the um, all the knowledge and the data is concentrated. And it's uh, very similar to, to the progress report which the um, UN Secretary General delivers every year at the HLPF, at the High Level Political Forum. And what we see is stagnation. We see a few green areas where there is some progress uh, in, in achieving uh, the targets or in actually showing positive developments in the indicators which are there to be measured. So this is, um, there are many indicators, but it's a very um, restricted view of reality. What UN indicators which are available for all countries can actually show. So you should not mistake this progress report with reality and with um, down-to-earth analysis, real empirical analysis at country level. And also uh, in, in countries, countries when, uh, when they make their own 
sustainable development strategies to translate the SDGs to their own reality, they often choose different indicators because they have better indicators in order to also use uh, data collected on the basis of these indicators to inform policy making and adjust policies. And this is something you can do at national level or even at local level, but it's very difficult to do in the same quality at global level. So this is, that therefore this picture is a very reduced one. But what we can say is that we have uh, a slowing down or even a, re a reversal of progress, especially in, in regarding poverty and hunger due to COVID and due to um, the uh, inflation and uh, rising cost of living due to the um, uh, Russian attack in Ukraine. Um, we also have long-term long -term negative trends in um, uh, climate action. We, we are still not able to phase out fossil fuels or to reduce for subs, uh, fossil, subs, fossil fuels and subsidies for fossil fuels. Uh, we have very negative trends in biodiversity loss and also regarding uh, inequality. There is, regarding marine protection of marine areas, there is a little positive indicator, but that's only because the countries have decided to have protected ocean areas. But it doesn't say anything about the quality of that protection. So, um, and, and another important insight is that if no action, not, no real action is taken, then it's not only a matter because we do not achieve the SDGs, sounds a bit bureaucratic, right? But if you look at the substance matter of it, it means that further crisis will arise, compounding crisis. So it's a real thing we are talking about here, not a, an indicator measurement um, exercise. So um, where are we heading? That was a question we asked ourselves. How can we find out where we are heading at? So we tried, there is a very little literature on this actually, on SDG implementation. Uh, there's a lot of grey literature, but not a lot of published um, academic literature on this. So what are countries doing? What uh, is the, the real substantial effect of the, um, the, the, the strategies they are giving themselves? What we can see is, and this, this, this is a graph taken from the SDSN uh, progress report, the sustainable development report they deliver every year, um, where we can see that there are, uh, we distinguish here other countries and G20 countries, and what we can see is that there are a lot of high-level statements, there are strategies and action plans, there is even budgeting and monitoring, there, is, there are COVID-19 pla recovery plans which were aligned more or less ambitiously with all SDGs or parts of the SDGs, like the European Green Deal, for example, which included uh, many environmental um, SDGs or hung, uh, agriculture related SDGs. But the real impact you can derive from that is questionable. Yeah. Uh, and what we see is that due to the uh, COVID crisis and, um, <clears throat> and a cost of living crisis, the financing gap is increasing. At the same time, we see decreasing funding budgets for international cooperation. Um, and this, despite we know that global solidarity is instrumental to human security, as my colleague has just uh, said. Uh, and what we also see is that what would be a, a, a force which would push implementation forward, because we, the, the idea of the SDGs is to benefit societies, to benefit citizens. Yeah? If there were real accountability, that could help. It, it would show the gap in implementation and it would help to, to, um, uh, to push public policies forward that support implementation processes. But what we can also see is that accountability processes and in institutions are weak. Um, this is um, my previous institution and did some research on that. So um, you will find the sources in the report, but you can still just Google IDOS and SDGs, and you could find also some interesting literature on that. But the policy process shows some fulfillment, but re, uh, not sufficient impact on the ground. What we then did is we looked at, um, at scenario literature and modeling we could find on what does, um, uh, when, the, when the SDGs were developed, when they were elaborated, when they were negotiated, and when the, um, the, the agenda was adopted, there um, was quite some um, analysis done on 
what uh, does it mean to have an ag a complex agenda like that where the, the, the goals are and the targets are purposefully designed in a way to show the interlinkages between them. So a very complex policy agenda. And there was a debate, let's under, uh, an effort made to understand the complexity of these interlinkages and to distinguish synergies from trade-offs, for example. Uh, and, and then one insight, of course, was that it's very difficult, the, the global situation actually is the, the sum of very different local situations where the same uh, policy fields may be interrelated in different ways. It, it really depends on the, on the context and on the local reality. Uh, but then we said, let's not give up, let's find out what can be said about global achievement. And we found uh, studies which try to, to analyze that and they, what, what we show here, and this is a very important um, uh, result from our perspective, is that they try to model uh, incremental activities, so not so ambitious interventions, and compare what would they achieve by 2030 and by 2050, and what would be the difference if you design um, ambitious interventions, like um, um, phasing out coal and biomass use, putting a price on carbon, and um, redistributing also globally part of the revenue generated by this carbon price, um, adjusting energy subsidies, so abolishing um, many of them, and so on. And the interesting result was that you, with, with these incremental um, uh, interventions, you don't achieve them. You don't achieve them neither in 2030 nor in 2050. But with ambitious action, you, you reach significant improvements by 2030 and you may achieve uh, many of them by 2050. And um, this is a sobering um, uh, result because it shows that the, um, uh, that it, you, you really have to struggle for ambitious policy actions and you have to go into the conflict which is needed for, for, um, for making such decisions. And this small step approach leads you to disaster, to put it a bit uh, uh, more bluntly. It's, that is more bluntly than the language in the report, um, but the result uh, shows that. Um, so that's why we say game-changing interventions are needed. It sounds very nice, no game-changing interventions. Um, but what we actually realized is that this, what the implementation of the SDGs requires is not policy making in the business as usual way, but to really uh, shoulder the understand that it's about transformation. It's not about incremental change, but really deep transformations. Um, and for accelerating progress, it is also important to, to have a good understanding of the interlinkages between the SDGs, how they play out in specific contexts uh, and for groups, uh, and to understand also the differences in interlinkages between high-income groups and middle-income groups or low-income uh, low, uh, groups where uh, it's interesting to see that in high-income groups, this is, has been disappearing now. Ah, okay, it's back. No? Is this something I'm touching here? No. Anyway, so I see, still have it on my screen here. <laughs> um, yeah, there it is. So uh, what is important is that uh, trade-offs are larger in high-income groups. So high-income countries have more to lose in transformations. Yeah? They have to change more, while low- and middle-income countries, in the end, gain more. And I think, for me, this is a, a, a positive uh, result, in a, in a way. Not if I think about political resistance or societal resistance, but I think of such an analysis shows also the, the dimension of redistribution in material consumption and in... in um, human um, livelihoods which is needed if we want the world to be more sustainable. So the important uh, uh, conclusion from that, from the analysis of the, lit of the literature on link interlinkages is that context-specific analysis 
are absolutely important and should gu uh, guide priority setting. So not political compromise yeah? or political negotiation, but an analysis should be the basis. And that closer collaboration between science and policy is needed. And um, that is also important once um, strategic approaches or policy approaches have been adopted to assess the impact so that you know where you are going. And um, this sounds very technical, um, but it's quite demanding, but it would give you the knowledge for readjusting the course you are going. Um, and we, for us, this was an important conclusion because it says something very specific about the science policy interface. It's something which you really need if you want to fulfill your commitment to the, 20, uh, 50, 15, uh, to the 2030 agenda, and it's not something you can either do or not. Um, <clears throat> and now I come to uh, one central graph which, is, which we took from the previous report, the 2019 report. Some of you might have seen it. And that report had also worked on interlinkages. They had assumed they were important. In our report, we show, yes, they are important because we now have literature which shows it. And what we, um, so what it says is on top, you see six entry points for transformative action, focusing on, and, and, and these entry points, they, show, they um, always refer to several of the SDGs, of relevant SDGs together. So it's about human well-being and capabilities. It's about sustainable and just economies. So it's not about productive economies or effective economies or efficient ones. No, it's about just and sustainable economies. It's about sustainable food systems and healthy nutrition, energy decarbonization with universal access to energy, uh, urban and peri-urban uh, development, and global environmental commons. And then it's about the levers. That was, and, and we, in our report, we focused very much on the levers. What are the instruments you can use for pushing uh, these changes, these transformative changes? And the, um, these terms are very general. It's about governance, so it's about institutional arrangements, it's about the quality of democracy, it's about how uh, um, decisions are made, it's about the regulation and the workings of economy and finance, it would be possible to talk about that for hours, of course, but we will discuss it later, I assume. It's about individual and collective action. So different patterns of decision, uh, of, and, and priorities for decision making and for um, uh, achieving specific uh, services, for example. It's about the right use of science and technology. And we added a fifth dimension. We added the dimension of capacity building because when you say that the kind of political action and of societal action and societal uh, collaboration needed for achieving transformation is qualitatively different, then you need new capacities for achieving that. Because such transformations processes you won't achieve in one legislator in four years or so. This will probably demand more time and it will require a certain consensus in society and among political parties that the trajectory is not abandoned once there is a new government and the whole process is interrupted. This is very demanding, and, that's, uh, and also to organize the societal coalitions of support for these transformation processes. And that's why we say capacity building is important, and this is not in the traditional North-South way. The North teaches the South what capacities should be developed, but this is a challenge for all of us. It's, I don't think that there is a country in Europe which can say, I know how to do transformation, and I will do it this is these, uh, because our um, patterns of behavior in policy making, in, in, in organizing political competition also, are very much based on distinction and not on, on, a basic, on reaching a basic agreement and on having a, a, a shared strategic vision which spans over 10 years or so. Um, so to show some of these, uh, just two examples for what these... Um, game-changing interventions uh, could be for sustainable and just economies. Um, <clears throat> we say a just economy needs to be pro-poor, uh, it's an old term, pro-poor growth, yeah, it's very old, but what we want to say with this is that it should include redistribution measures, so taxing. It should uh, 
it, it is, it's necessary to double welfare transfers in low-income countries. That is an insight which came, came from analyzing what happened in COVID. Yeah? So this is a change in the language because we had a lot of talk about pro-poor growth but in, 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 uh, when we had the MDGs, but we didn't talk about welfare systems. We didn't talk about social security systems, about social infrastructure, about public funding for that. Um, we say for sustainable and just economies, we need climate policies and we need global carbon pricing. We need to encourage lifestyles that promote sufficiency levels. So it's not about our children have to be better off than us and measure that better off in more and more and more material consumption, for example. And also in green innovation, which would mean circular and sharing economy models. Um, and the translation to concrete measures obviously is very, is very context specific again. And in food systems and nutrition patterns, we say that agricultural systems need to be multifunctional multifunctional, so not only productive in terms of producing um, uh, um, food stock or, or uh, food as such, but they need to be based on, on, on ecological principles of land use uh, of, of agricultural production and not only produce but also protect and um, uh, promote uh, biodiversity water quality and so on, and uh, um, uh, healthy soils, for example. Improve efficiency in the use of irrigation and fertilizers, reduce food waste, and uh, half consumption of meat in high consumption regions and adapt plant-based diets. So when I say this, and you imagine that you are a political actor who wants to win elections with that, you see uh, the ambition of it. <clears throat> uh, and in the other, the last example I want to give is um, uh, for the global environmental commons, and some of this is reflected, for example, in the global framework now for biodiversity, so to expand protected areas, to abandon intensive agricultural practices in protected areas. I mean, it's a contradiction in itself, actually, that this is still possible. To reforest degraded areas um, and shift I mean, it sounds very elegant. Shift societal preferences towards conservation land use. So, I mean, it means that you actually enable citizens uh, that to give them the confidence that they will still have a living even if the areas are conserved. That's what's behind of it, yeah, from the perspective of the SDGs. You do not do it um, autocratically, but you provide them in other means. So... Um, and then we said, okay, if, if it's about transformation, let's have a better understanding of what transformation actually means. And we were very pragmatic in, in this model because those of you who are familiar with innovation theory you will immediately recognize um, this is the S-curve from innovation theory. It's, it's very much based on the diffusion process of technological innovations. But what we thought is that it's um, these phases of technological diffusion of innovations which say innovations emerge, they become attractive because the usual way of, that's, that's the green line on, below. And innovations become attractive because the um, traditional way of doing things doesn't work anymore. It's, it gets destabilized. Um, like fossil fuel based infrastructures don't work anymore because they ruin everything else. Um, I'm a bit simple now. Uh, so it is important to accelerate the diffusion of the innovations and to stabilize them so that they become the new normal. And the important point here is that the old way of doing things has to disappear. It's, it, it's not, we don't win anything if these two ways of doing things exist in parallel. And that's why we have these two lines crossing each other to show the societal resistance which emerges when old structures uh, or um, conventional structures uh, need to disappear. And it's this process of, of um, getting support for innovations, getting support for abolishing conventional infrastructures, and having the strength to elaborate new business models and to provide new jobs and provide livelihoods for people who are associated with those sectors of the economy which actually have no future. And I'm sorry to interrupt you guys. Could you Okay, yeah. Um, I, I don't hear myself, so you have to tell me. Yeah, uh, thank you. So, 
this is the, the process we, we uh, use as a model for explaining the, the political challenges which are associated with these transformations. And at the same time, the, the um, show that it has to do, we, we call it innovation, you can also call it transformation or change, um, but that this is uh, uh, something where um, you have to be aware of, of the resistance which, which might emerge and anticipate conflict and invest uh, in, in resolving those conflicts. And that's why, and this is the type of capacity you have to develop, not only as a government or as a policymaker, but also in the private sector, also in, soci in, in civil society uh, um, organizations, so that you can come together and, and elaborate uh, in the ideal way and elaborate solutions uh, together. I think I will skip um, this one because it, it just shows what happens when you abandon the innovation uh, and the acceleration path where um, you have um, public policy supporting the diffusion of the innovation and then you imagine you have a change of government and policies are discontinued and then uh, you end up in decelerating the adoption and you, you may, may even have a system breakdown. An, an example I use is the, the train system in Germany. I think you know what I mean. No? <laughs> uh, under investment over decades, um, despite um, public uh, commitments in words, lead actually to a system breakdown. No? Um, and then you don't have an alternative if you want to move away from individual transport to collective transport, yeah, which is a very important part of um, transformation in the, in the mobility uh, sector. I will also skip this one because I was told to be quicker. And um, I wanted to share with you the calls to action we um, elaborated in the end. Um, we had to really, I really had to push my colleagues to think about calls to action because they were so happy with a good analysis. Um, <laughs> but then I said, no, but we have to make recommendations and they have to be um, easy to understand and they have to show the action which has to be taken. And, um, and we had a brainstorming and we came up with some things. And um, now, uh, as we are already heading towards the next HLPF, you can also say what hasn't come through. So our most important um, recommendation was actually to say, we need, to com we need a commitment from governments for um, accelerated action so that this transformation is implemented. And we wanted governments to, to elaborate action plans which focus on those areas where they lag behind and also on those areas where rich countries, for example, are willing to support uh, poorer countries on this transformation pathway so that they should make such national plans, prioritizing key SDGs and addressing bottlenecks. And also we wanted that from business and from local government. I see more activity in local government often than at national level. And um, now I, I heard that at the next high level political forum there is no time set aside for presenting those action plans. And that is a real pity, I think, because it shows for me a lack of, of the commitment we would actually like to see. We said it is absolutely important to invest now in building capacities for transformation. So learn what you're doing. Monitor the impact of your policy so you see what is the actual effect of what I, what I say I am doing. And if I'm not achieving the effect, how can I adjust that? If you, in, in Germany, we were extremely shocked when we saw the impact of COVID on the, um, on the reading, writing, and math capacities of, of 10-year-olds. They, they are one year behind. And we are, I'm not seeing in many initiatives in correcting that. That is one way of monitoring the impact of your policies. And we would need that in many areas because the time is, is uh, of the essence. And, and then I would like to, dry, to draw your attention to the last two points. This is a very also abstract way of talking. Improve critical underlying conditions for SDG implementation. In the, in the text you will find that we think about, we have seen how much war and conflict 
draw societies apart from reaching any improvement. And we have seen a, a modeling by, by UNDP for Yemen, uh, and Yemen is, is, not, is below the baseline due to the conflict, below the baseline of 2015, yeah? and, and going downwards. Yeah? So um, conflict is, is also behind the, 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 the um, deterioration in, in SDG2, hunger. Yeah? Hunger has in, increased um, a lot. So um, that is prevent conflict, solve conflict. Then ensure fiscal space. That is the, so many countries are um, in, in co close to bankruptcy because of the, in debt, the public debt they had to incur to, to mitigate the social and economic impacts of the COVID crisis. And focus on marginali marginalized groups. And when you don't do that, you weaken democracy, you weaken the, the body politic, you weaken the societal capacities to even think of how, what to do to improve um, the situation. And the last point is work with science. You will be happy to hear that. Um, <clears throat> but what we, um, what I would, would like to um, emphasize here is, um, is to our call to invest in international cooperation of science systems and not you, you know the, the EU uh, model of, of cooperating. They, have, um, they promote cooperation uh, between the EU and, and uh, large developing countries, for example, because um, it enhances competitiveness of science systems and economies uh, of the participating countries. But what we saw in our analysis is that 70% of the people live in countries with very, very weak science and technology systems which means they lack the context-specific knowledge for understanding the situation they are in and for being able to develop own strategies for finding solutions. And this cannot be. So we think that scientific cooper international cooperation should also invest in the common good and simply for strengthening the science systems in these countries so that they, can, that they are empowered to define their own solutions. And this is something I would like to highlight because it's normally not part of scientific policy uh, or science policy uh, strategizing. So this is the, I think this is the end of it. So um, we want to say that transformations often are inevitable because there is technological progress, but what is important is to shape transformation, to shape them in a way that it is beneficial for society and, and sustainable in the long term. Um, and that's why, uh, this is something we said also under the impact of, of war, uh, we do not only need security from war or violence, but we need energy security, we need a stable climate, we need sufficient water, food and social uh, security. And it's for achieving that, we need to act as a human collective and we are convinced that the 2030 agenda remains a very important tool for uh, enhancing international cooperation even in the polarized and uh, a world we are living in today. Thank you.